So, so I'm really happy I'm speaking to you, Mark, because I have no idea how you do what you do. <laughs> so um, those of you know, Mark, knows, know Mark's work, that you have this um, ability to create stories that are, that are kind of universal and informative and educative and deeply personal at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. The personal letter is, mm -hmm. is a figure of, of your work, um, the travelogue, the use of landscape. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of fascinated. I've got lots of questions about mm -hmm. your process. So. <laughs> So beware. So, but first of all, let's just start with the, with the basics. So, tell us why Orson. I mean, he's obviously the filmmaker who is m for most cinephiles, most of us in the audience, would be the, would be the person who often shepherds us into cinema. Is yeah. that how he was with you? I think so. You know, he's a, as I said at the beginning, he's a sort of father figure in a way, isn't he? He's one of those founding, cre even though he came late in in the history of cinema, but he was somebody who helped to tell us what movies were. I, you know, I and I studied Orson, and my my friend Alistair's here tonight, and he we studied together. And you know, he was, and th it helped. He, you know, he was so extravagant in his imagination. He was so radical. He was an experimental artist in the studio system. You know, he was a punk in a way. You know, and that's all all inspiring. But you know, you know, I've focused in my work more on films from. Iran or Africa or I haven't addressed the canon very much you know because I you know not just because I think so many people are doing that yeah. but this was a, new, a unique opportunity yeah. to look at this really famous person this 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 person who's so much part of the pantheon in a new way and I couldn't say no I just thought why why not why not occasionally just go back to the to, to some of some of the stuff that feels like the past and yeah. we look at it and it was a serendipitous beginning, wasn't it? It was you meeting Orson's daughter yeah. and having this conversation. So tell us a little about yeah. the genesis. Yeah, I mean, I had known that there was a, there, I, I'd read Sam, Simon Callow's books and I'd read some other stuff. And so I knew there were drawings. I knew there were paintings. I didn't know there were that many. And then I went to Traverse City, Michigan, Michael Moore's film festival there, a very good film festival. I'm on the board of that film festival. And there was this um, uh, wild woman called <laughs> Beatrice Wells. and. Uh, she was a lot of fun. I liked her and we drank a few drinks and she said she'd seen some of my work and she said there's this stuff about my father and so I went to her house to look at it and I thought oh yeah there is a new way of looking at this man. You know, you're either reluctant to look at the canon or actually you want to revive the canon. And, and if we had actually managed to contact her by phone earlier, she would, I quite liked that we didn't in a way, but you know, she would have said that she's worried that her father is going to be forgotten. Now, those of us in the room don't think that Orson, we don't think that Orson Welles is going to be forgotten, but it's always worth looking at somebody in a new light, isn't yes. it? Taking the light and sh shining it in a different direction. And it's also surprising, actually. I mean, I think we, we talk about this here often, is that we can show works in the canon that we think everybody's seen this. And there's often a new audience I know. that just like, they've never, I know. don't know the work. When, when, I saw the, when I saw Citizen Kane in, in Michael Moore's film festival, he said, how many of you had not, have not seen Citizen Kane? And about two thirds of the audience put up their hand. Right. Right. So, you know, yeah. maybe maybe that's one of the things we have to do in film culture. Obviously, you know, we are we are very interested in broadening, broadening and planting a bomb under the canon, frankly. But also there's stuff within the canon that we have to revive mm -hmm. and we have to renew and we have to rejuvenate. And yeah. that's worth doing. So this this box of drawings that we see yes. you lovingly open. So this is has anyone had anyone seen that that work before? And, mm -hmm. and how did it feel you? opening that for yeah, the first it felt time. Mm -hmm. Bloody exciting. Yeah, was it just you? Was was you were you on your own when you opened it? It's exactly it? like that. Really? Yeah. 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 No, we we opened it briefly in the storage facility in New York just okay. to see that it was what it was. But I said, I oh, know I don't want to look at it because it's going to take a while. And uh, so we brought it home and we bought an extra seat on the plane, my producer Adam Daughtry and me and um, and I got it home and opened it up, and that was what you saw. You put on the gloves and you open it, and it's a treasure trove. And those encounter, you know, the way we respond visually sometimes is extremely fast. And I went through my first rake through those drawings was it probably took me 30 minutes maximum. But in those 30 minutes, I was probably forming the impressions that were lasting impressions, and that that influenced the film. So let's let's come about how how 
the magic, the how you do what you do. <laughs> so you've got this box of, of, of drawings, you're going through it very fast and tight, you're forming impressions. What then seems to happen in a very short period of time, I just realized it was only probably a year ago that you would be forming this idea and a year <clears> later, <throat> here we are. What happens between that moment and this very elegant, coherent, connected journey? Because the other thing that I read was that the, the, the drawings weren't dated. So you no. didn't have a sense of where they were in his timeline, mm -hmm. yet somehow you seem to piece them so mm -hmm. elegant together with, with his, his master work. So how did you do mm. that? First of all, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Secondly, you know, that we have all strengths and weaknesses. And one of my strengths, I think, is structure. You know, I can see structure straight away. Like, so I knew the structure of, I knew what f structure this film should have within probably, dare I say this, three minutes really? of 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 hearing about the work you know and it, yeah, structure is something you, know, you hear lots of people who spend a year or two in the edit suite looking for the story yes. looking for the stru this the structure it's never been my issue at all you know, the structure almost comes like an aperçu a kind of out of the blue thing yeah. so i knew really 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 quickly that it should have roughly this structure and and for better or worse it means the good side about that is that it's it's a very quick way of working you know right. you could say that maybe this st structure of the sort of mythic thing pawn knight king jester etc you know you could say that there'd be there could be something uh more subtle than that but i just wanted a rigorous i wanted a shape in yeah. which to, yeah. to and, and, and once you've got the shape yeah. then in the edit you don't have to think about the shape yeah. you have to frankly in the edit my job then is thinking about articulation and trying to say something emotional and talk directly to this man, etc. And so it's um, it just comes, you know, some people, you know, mm. sculptors are good at this. They, you get the structure first mm. and, and it's just the way my brain works. And do you write, so w when do you, obviously the other th um, mark of your work is your voice, mm -hmm. is the, it's the poetics of the language and mm. your voice. So mm. at what point does that come in? Do you shape that? Is that, do you sit and write? And then you're sculpting the image to, to, uh, to so, your narrative? So the, the structure comes first and then the writing comes. Uh, I always write to image. You know, I'm never going to oh. write a script. And I think you can tell when somebody's yeah. written a script and then they've tried to find images to match that, yeah. you know. And I, I, I um, remember uh, uh, one of the most influential films for me was a film that Pier Paolo Pasolini made. And it was one of his documentaries and it was called The Search for the locations for the gospel or of, I can't remember something like that and what he did was he shot a lot when he was looking for locations mm -hmm. then sat, sat in the edit suite and just spoke into the microphone in the present tense and he said here we did this or here we're doing that and the thisness and the that those words this mm -hmm. you know this is mm -hmm. that's my that's the dream word. That's the strongest word mm -hmm. for me when you're writing this kind of cinema. Because all all of you are sitting here, you're seeing this for the first time. And if I say this, it's like we're all watching it together in the moment. And I, I love that. I don't. I think that if you use other language, uh, then it sounds as if you've already thought it all through, and you know you're you're at a superior position of knowledge I'd like it to be a bit more present tense than that and that's what I the try what I tried to do tried to do in the writing and the and the I mean the gorgeous relationship between the drawings and you were right when we were talking in the green room you're saying there's something about because I saw it on a small computer screen yeah. there's something about <laughs> seeing those drawings yeah. so big yeah yeah because one of those drawings would be let, let me just show. yeah that's wow it. wow we are we are talking about a hundred thousand times bigger, wow. you know, and that's the magic of cinema. And cinema is one of the cinema is bigger than life, yeah. as we know. You know, the face of Garbo, like yes. bigger than any face we've ever seen. Yes. You know, so that that's you know, it's really good to take something like this, which is about quite small stuff, yeah, like artworks, and put it up on that scale. Yes, and especially to juxtapose it with with actual live action scenes from his films. Yeah, they are the ones that the the, the one with the Moroccan. Uh, drawings and yeah, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's satisfying. You know, it takes yeah. a lot of time to look for those things, but yeah. I saw that Moroccan. The Moroccan drawings are particularly good, I have to say. And then you look at Arcadian again, and you think, "Fuck, that's the same. That's the same image." You yeah. know? And and you want to, you know, that you want to do that work, because it's 
it's true that these are these visual connections and you want to do that work so we can see it. 128 acting credits Wells had and 54 directing ones. Did you watch everything? <laughs> uh, so. No, no, I haven't seen all his acting, his, his, his roles as an actor, you know. Um, no, I didn't. And, you know, I read a lot, you know, and I read there's a gr there's been a great recent book called uh, Orson Welles in Italy. I basically read the stuff I hadn't read. Mm. I, I'd skimmed through the previous things, but there's been a lot of new stuff. There's a great good book by, I think it's Patrick. Gilly, Gilligan called the young Orson Welles and I read that and you know I knew the work well and I've got a good visual memory so I didn't have to go through it all again. Mm -hmm. um, so t tell us about moments of revelation that you uh -huh. might have had. Mm -hmm. Do you remember kind of so you're going back into the work uh, into the life's work of a, of a man you know quite well mm -hmm. but through this different avenue. Do you remember moments of revelation at the time where you were like I never even thought about that I didn't mm -hmm. know that this about this particular person that mm -hmm. came through the artwork Macbeth yeah. you know Macbeth I mean I had just thought it wasn't very good uh, and it's very very good mm. you know there's a long 11 minute scene in the middle of Macbeth a middle of Macbeth I don't even remember really clocking that you know mm. and the some of the things that are put in there you know that top shot you know mm. what is that it's pure abstraction you know mm. and so that was the big revelation for me maybe i just forgotten when i first saw it but certainly macbeth is visually more radical mm. i think than any of the other films i.e closer to sketching and mm. uh, so so that was one discovery there was another more human thing you know when, when we talk about these legendary figures they it makes them feel as if they're on the moon it makes them feel psychologically another world away you know there's the real distance of things and then there's a psychological distance of things and orson welles was a million miles away in my head yes. and he's not anymore yeah I've, you know, i felt like that watching the yeah, film actually yeah, he, he's really close you know he's i've got his boot in my bag and yeah. you know and all that shit you know and or and, and you know when you travel in his footsteps you know there's a i don't it's not necessary it's not necessary to find the human scale in someone in order to understand them but for yeah, me it helps it does you know? and i think what i liked about your film is what you got a sense of is the influences, the things mm -hmm. that had influenced mm -hmm. this man to to see the world the way he did, mm -hmm. which is you often don't see that, you just see the end mm -hmm. result, mm -hmm. but you don't see the kind of, you know, from his mother and the tree and yeah. all these different influences yeah. that go into shaping it. Yeah, I really wanted to get his mother in there and I, I, I mean, I was serious when I thought that, you know, I think she's a seriously interesting person, you know, and Hanny Flanagan, that great woman who, who, who funded him so much, you know, and so you want to, you want to, put in some context because you were all a bit suspicious of the idea of the, the soul genius and also wells was very wells knew a lot about art you know he yeah. saw a lot of art he was articulate he knew what who the what the painting world was and yeah. there's you know there's tintoretto in here and there's goya in here and there's other people in here and that isn't forced on him you know i think that was part of his visual language that was part of the way he spoke and the way he saw the world yeah. and um my last question was how is this making this film change the relationship to the man but I, i'm interested in now in how has it changed the relationship to the canon i guess yeah yeah like you were saying you don't this is yeah. not normally the road you travel but yeah i mean i i turned my back in the canon you know i it's years since i've seen a john ford film it's years since i've seen a howard hawks film it's years since i've even, even seen a kukor film you know and you you know you turn you get angry for reasons that we don't need to articulate to say you know at, at film history and I've gone through the story of film and some of the other things I did were some expressions of that anger and then you go back to the harbour you go back to the thing that launched you in the first place and there are pleasures in going back and this was a pleasure in doing that I think you know I'm still suspicious of the canon in some ways and there are some people that I would take down a peg or two or three or four <laughs> or five but uh, overall you know I think that it's it, it, it's good it's useful to return to some of the classics you could say you know although I wouldn't call him a classicist as well it's useful to re return to some of the things that formed you and yeah. see if they're still alive if they're still formative if there's if if there yeah and he still for me is 
I have a feeling that this man really looked at the world. I really, you know, there's a feeling when you read his letters, I've been lucky enough to read his letters when he first got to Ireland, for example, and he's astonished. You know, and, and if, you, if, if you're somebody who's sort of, who've already got a premeditated sense of what the world is, then you're gonna be less astonished. You're looking to confirm. You're also looking for, I remember I've been in Iran quite a lot and I've seen Western journalists. They almost go with a shot list. Here's what we're looking for. Here's where lo lots of women in chadors, mania, isn't that right? And they're, we're angry, we're, you're looking for, there's a certain image we're looking for and then you find it and you think, hallelujah, I found it. I don't think that what happened with Wells, there is a real sense that he went out with open eyes and was constantly surprised. That's my impression, at least, from the drawings. Yeah, I am, <laughs> despite appearances. You know, I care about that sort of stuff. You know, I frame carefully. You know, I used to work with cinematographers for a long time, and I've been lucky enough to work with one of the great cinematographers, Christopher Doyle, on two films, you know, and I care about that stuff, you know. And uh, so I do very few close-ups. I frame wide, and I'm very interested in compositions, one-third, fifth compositions, etc. I love that stuff. It also... Um, m relaxes me, you know, when I went to a lot of places here, you know, you can see Morocco and you can see a lot all over America and you can see Spain and you can see West of Ireland. And in each case, I just love that moment of going and framing. It's, it's the zone. Good. Can I ask you, Mark, a quick one is that you're a rare breed and the fact that you're a kind of, you're a critic and a curator a writer around the work and you also make work and often people don't cross that line for a reason so people who write about film and a, and a kind of um in the in the realm of being a critic won't cross the line because they they're so used to observing work that they're terrified about having their own work observed that way do you know what i mean mm -hmm. has clearly that's never been a question for you no because you know the, the my writing about cinema is like less than 5% of what I do, you know. Mm. And I started as a filmmaker, you know, and so I was, I, even though I, I made TV, TV documentaries for a long time, so I did that before I ever wrote about cinema. Mm. So the writing thing came afterwards, and therefore it didn't scare me as much, you right. know. I still love it, and I st it doesn't feel like a big difference to me, in yeah. a way, you know. Yeah. This is a letter, in a way, you know, but... It, yeah. uh, and yeah. the, the film that I made with the brilliant, we're, we're lucky enough to have the brilliant Mania Akbari here tonight, you know, and, and the, the great Iranian filmmaker, if you've seen Kirostami's 10, she was the lead in 10 and she's a great filmmaker. Anyway, she and I have done films together and they're often letters. We're also lucky enough to have the great um, Jack Claff, who's a great actor, director, academic, uh, who um, just happened to be in a, few films you've never heard of, probably like Star Wars and a Bond movie, etc. But also he did the voice of Orson Welles in this. So Jack, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, but that, that question you ask, Aileen, I've never been scared of writing about this stuff mm. because it feels like the same kind of thing to yeah. me. You know, yeah. it's it's about it's a kind of pa it's about the passion, yeah. and and for me, I've I've always I've always loved making images the most, and so that came first. Mm. Yeah, I think I think he was. You know, the for me, the key line is that Jack says it beautifully. I was a satirist, and I think Wells was a satirist. You know, Citizen Kane. The line that I have him say to me in his reply letter. You know, Citizen Kane was close to parody, close to farce. They're not my words. They're Orson Welles's words in an interview that he gave with Andre Bazin. So, I think that he sort of felt a sense of mockery of the great imperium of the United States. In that sense, he's close to a writer like Gore Vidal. I think who had the same sense of the fun. You know. This makes it contemporary, obviously, because there's, I'm sure we've all noticed there's something happening in the U.S. at the moment, which is close to parody, close to farce, you know, and uh, and I think that I think you can see that in Wells, you know, in, in a lot of the work. Uh, and he had a real sense of humor. And what we don't have, of course, is his theater work. And we hear a lot of, we can read a lot about it again through Simon Callow's writings and others. And there's a clear sense that the theater work had a real sense of the circus about it. Uh, and the ludic, I love that word ludic, you know, which is a, you know what that means? It means a modernist, but mocking or funny at the same time. And I think he was a ludic artist. 
you know, I don't know the full answer to that. You know, there was a lot of stuff. There was there was a lot of artwork, and you know, Orson Welles is. Um, estate, the, the legal documents are online, and basically Beatrice was left the rights to all the art, you know, but, but oh yeah, Kudar owned some of it and things, so a lot of it was just packaged away, and he died so really quite a long time ago now, and people just put it in box and safe places until they could work out what to do with it, and then they didn't quite know what to do with it, you know, and so that the simple answer is it was put in a box after he died and kept in a safe place until somebody could work out what to do with it. You know, my next film, which is, is just been announced, is longer than the story of film, you'll be pleased to hear, um, and it's slower, you know. <laughs> I can't, you know, what I, you know, there's a difference between, have, have you ever seen Terence Davis on stage? He's a bundle of laughs, but his films are wrist slitters, right? <laughs> you know, there's a difference between how you are as a human being and the work you want to make, you know? And my work, I need, for me, I need to have, for, I just have this compulsion to make something feeling like quite nighttime, quite intimate, like one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera, and I know, puts people, some people to sleep. I know some people feel this film's far too long and they're boring bits in the middle, although the beginning and the end's quite good. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, you can't, you can't change your style in a way. I would love to have other styles, but you are what you are, so I can't change it, unfortunately. And also, I think what, what's, what's really interesting with this film, the fact that I think we started by saying 62 cinemas around the country will be showing yeah. this simultaneously on Friday, it's, it's kind of extraordinary given the fact that we live in this very fast-paced, yes. um, media-saturated world that your work really endures. There's something in the pace of your work and in the attention to the narrative and to the unfolding narrative that I mm -hmm. think is deeply, deeply compelling and I think probably will outlast well, Many other pieces you, of you know, I, I just read um, a brilliant biography of George Bernard Shaw, and he wrote, I'm sorry this letter's too long. I didn't have time to write a shorter one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's a brilliant thing, you know. Yeah. You know and, and rapidity can be exhausting. And I know, you know, all the time, like especially about the story of film, I travelled around the world publicising the story of film. The, con the constant question was, why is it so long, etc. And I was just, just saying, you know, people... You know, people have the desire for the long unfolding narrative, the box set, the Breaking Bad. You know, people want a kind of sense of being lost in the labyrinth of a story. Mm -hmm. Of course, boring is boring, right? So, you, you know, but you, you, I often want to feel as if somebody's taken me by the hand mm -hmm. and said, come here mm. and I'm, we're going slowly mm. and then I'm going to let you go mm. and let's see what happens, you know. So that question of pacing and storytelling and the long form, the epic, the unraveling of self, the picaresque, all these things are really valid and I'm, I don't buy the fact that uh, all of us and particularly our young people want the quick hit. Of course there's a quick hit but once you've had a lot of quick hit you want something more nourishing and you want to get lost in something big. Mm. Mm. And, and beautiful and enriching. And so you have to you have to hold your nerve and believe in that.